Good morning and a warm word of welcome to our Good Friday service. Just to organize ourselves this morning, you're going to be seated the whole time. So relax. No up and down jumping. We're going to sing, but you have to promise me when you are seated and singing, you will come up straight and project the words. <laughs> so, um, and the readers will come up and they will do their readings and I will do my readings from down here. So there's no announcements. You can follow it in the bulletin and um, the flow and we just, we just go. And if there's a, something wrong, we just work around it. Thank you for everybody that's here today and for Andrew that helped me w and he picked the music and it is going to be a very quiet, peaceful service. At the end, we're going to do a two-minute silence. It's time for prayer and then we will conclude and see you on Easter, uh, Easter Sunday, which is the Resurrection Sunday. Also for those online, welcome, and I hope you will experience what we experience here in the sanctuary. So let us open with a prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, we gather as those who sense abundant grace in the abundance of our lives, but who remain plagued by the reality of want and injustice in our world. We gather today to bear witness to suffering and death upon a cross. We are appalled at the injustice and cruelty of such inhumanity, not only in Jesus' story, but of days in our lives when violence, war upon war, and the murderous killing of innocent children right in front of our eyes. May this day of darkness not hinder our resolve to follow in Jesus' way and to make our world a better place. In the midst of unspeakable suffering and the callousness of crucifixion, let us hold on to hope in resurrection. This is our prayer. Amen. We're going to ask Andrew to play for us the Nimrod.
Words on the Cross, Luke 23, verses 33, 34. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Words on the Cross, number two. Luke 23, 39 to 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The second man on the cross. Upon a hill two crosses stand, 
beneath a darkened sky. One thief, amidst his final breaths, catches a Savior's eye. No church had known his footsteps, no hymns had he revered, yet in his heart a spark ignites as paradise draws near. He knew not all of the dogmas, the prayers of righteous tone, his life, a map of missteps, now to the wind all thrown. But in this moment, clarity as pain and peace collide, a man condemned, yet sees beyond with Jesus at his side. Remember me, he whispers, with humility and grace, a simple plea from a weary soul in this desolate place. Jesus turns with eyes that pierce the veil of pain and gloom. Today you'll walk with me in light beyond this earthly tomb. No creed he recited, no ritual did he perform. Yet in his final hour, he found a love that would transform. For grace does not discriminate. It hears the silent cries. It sees the heart. It knows the truth beneath the earthly lies. So let us learn from him who hung beside the cross of wood that faith is found not in the laws, but in doing as we should. To see the other, really see and offer them a hand for paradise is promised to those who understand in the shadow of redemption a thief and a king converse a moment of pure mercy in the universe for on that solemn sacred day as skies turned into night one soul found peace with jesus in paradise's light. Words on the cross, three. John 19, 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The next poem is dedicated to my mom in South Africa and to all moms across the world, a mother's love. A mother's love for divine embrace, guiding us with wisdom, filling every space. With tender arms and a heart so pure, she nurtures our spirits, helping us endure. Through sleepless nights and countless tears, she soothes our fears, erasing all our cares. Her love is a shelter, a beacon of light, guiding us through the darkest of nights. In her gentle touch, 
we find solace and peace, a love that never falters, a love that won't cease. Her words, like poetry, dance on our ears, filling our hearts with joy and wiping away our tears. A mother's love, a masterpiece in motion, unconditional, unwavering, like an endless ocean. She teaches us grace and the power of forgive, cherishing the moments, teaching us how to live. A mother's love, a love divine, a precious gift forever mine. In her arms I find my peace, a love that will never cease. It is curious that Matthew transliterated. Do you know what transliterated means? It means you try to let the words in one language sound the same in another language. So Matthew tr tried to transliterate it, the words Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani into the Greek as the Hebrew Eli. And Mark transliterated this as the Aramaic word Eloi. Lama is Hebrew, Lema is Aramaic, and is shown as that in both Gospels in the Greek, but translators will render it as Lama, the Hebrew, for whatever reason. Secondly, why did they transliterate it into Greek at all, and why not just write out in Greek, my God, my God, why hast, hast thou forsaken me? As for the word sabachthani, we are quite sure it can't be from the Aramaic. Because the Aramaic word to abandon or to forsake or to be unwanted is ta'atani, not sabachthani. However, it can be argued that the root word is, in reality is the Aramaic word shwach, which means to be kept, spared, or allowed, or to fulfill something to the end. If Jesus has really meant that God had abandoned him or forgot him, he would have used the word ta'atani, or nashatani, which means to forget. But he said, Sabachthani, which actually means, this is my destiny. My God, my God, this is my destiny. Words on the Cross 4. Matthew 27, 45 to 46, 
and Mark 15, verse 34. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which actually means, my God, my God, this is my destiny. Words on the Cross, 5, John 19, 28 and 29. Later, knowing that everything had now been done, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Jesus once issued a total open-ended invitation to everyone in the sound of his voice and then in the sound of our voices to come to him and drink. And the only qualification he mentions is thirst. He said, if anyone, anyone, any Pharisee, any chief priest, any officer trying to crucify him, any offended person, any thief hanging next to him, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It seems to me that there are three wonderful things implied in these words, if anyone thirsts. First, is that the gift of the water is free and very available. The only condition you must meet in need, if anyone thirsts. That's the condition. And the action you must take is, of course, to drink, receive the gift. There is no thought here of earning or meriting. Anyone who knows his own thirst is invited. Secondly, the human soul that has thirst. We know Jesus speaking in parables is not talking about a physical thirst, that's clear. But what he is saying is that the soul has something like physical thirst. When you go without water, your body gets thirsty then dehydrated and eventually dies. The soul is no different. When it goes without connection with its source, which is God, the soul gets thirsty. Your body was made to live on water. Your soul was made to live in connection with God. Thirdly, 
The, words in, the word thirst implies that what Jesus offers is satisfying and life-changing. Unspiritual humans look at a believer who delights in drawing near to Christ in oneness, in prayer, in study, and in witness, and all they can see is a fool or a hypocrite. They cannot imagine that any of these things is a delight and brings about a life transformation. Because the unspiritual humans have no thirst for Christ, and so the invitation of Jesus is a dead issue. But for the spiritual human being, when a drop of, wa of his water falls on the parched land of our soul, it does not make a puddle, it makes a spring. And from that spring, water will flow like a river. And when that river of blessing touches the, the heart of the world, the heart of the unspiritual human, then, and not until then, do we experience the climax of joy. Amen. The, word, the words on the cross, six and seven. John 19, 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And from Luke 23, 46. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We give two minutes of silence for reflection and prayer.
Let us pray. Do not be afraid or confused. You are a spiritual being thirsting for the water of Christ. A divine being having a human experience here on earth. You needed to be here in this place at this time on this day to hear this. The ancient knowledge carried by the light of the Holy Spirit shines in your soul. The divine teachings of Christ quench your thirsty mind. The unconditional love of God transforms your total being. Go forth, beloveds of God. Live as who you truly are, beings of light, and love wastefully. Amen. Amen.